All right. So our next speakers will be Hanno and Peter. And please join me in welcoming them. They will be talking about pattern matching, small enhancement, or mature future. Hanno and Peter, the stage is yours. Yes, good morning, Vox Days Bucharest, and welcome to our talk on pattern matching. My name is Hanno Embrechts, and I'm here together with my colleague Peter Wessels, and um, together we'll dive into this topic. So a bit about ourselves. My name is Hanno. I work at InfoSupport in the Netherlands as an IT consultant. I really enjoy speaking at conferences about tech stuff. And in my spare time, I play the guitar. Whenever I can, I try to combine the two. So I'm at DevOps Belgium, I did them at the same time. Um, not this time, but we will talk about music for sure. Um, at InfoSupport, we really like to innovate. And this is also the reason why we encountered pattern matching and investigated it a bit, it a bit further, which led to uh, this talk. Peter, a bit about you? Yes, I'm Peter. I also am an uh, IT consultant at InfoSupport. I'm a Java software engineer. And uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Yeah, so pattern matching. The first time we encountered this feature, I thought, well, that's a nifty trick that could make my life as a Java developer a bit easier. Um, so I thought it was kind of a small enhancement. But then we investigated it a bit further, and it turned out that it was kind of a, a, a bigger deal than just a small enhancement. And this is exactly the question that we want to ask ourselves to get today, together with you as attendees. Is pattern matching a small announcement for Java, or is it actually a major feature that we should really keep track of? Um, so let's dive into this question. The first time we encountered pattern matching was pattern matching for instance of in Java 14. So let's dive into an example. And of course, for an example to be relatable, I like to use a real world example. In this case, a music store. So I'm a musician. I really like browsing across music stores. And of course, due to the COVID situation, I wasn't able to do that physically. So why won't we just build today a digital music store? And for a music store to work, you need products. So the first product that we're adding to our music store is a guitar. And the only thing we're storing for a guitar right now is a name, but we will extend on this example in a few minutes. All our demo code will be on GitHub. The link will be on the final slide, so you can also browse it in your, in your own time. Uh, no problem. OK, so let's apply pattern matching to this guitar. Pattern matching, for instance, of is best demonstrated by using this example. Imagine you have uh, uh, retrieved a generic product from your database, for example, but it's a generic product type. And you want to know if it's an inst if it's runtime an instance of guitar. Well, you then, yeah, then you can just say to Java, is product an instance of a guitar? And if it is, then cast it to guitar and assign it to a local variable. But you're doing actually three separate things here. You're asking, is product a guitar? You perform a conversion by casting it to the guitar. And then finally, you declare a variable and bind its value. And then after you've done that, then finally, you can use this Les Paul guitar. A um, lot of drawbacks in this, although it's a famous pattern that is probably understood by all of you because you had to use it a lot, but the drawbacks are many. I mean, it's verbose. It's five lines of code for a very simple thing. Also, we need a type test and we need a cast. I always found that a bit superfluous. Why would we need to cast it if we're already sure that's a, that it's a guitar in the first place? And also the actual logic, which would probably end up here, seems much less important your attention is drawn to all this ceremony right here. And also the guitar type is repeated three times. All things I don't really like, but the situation would improve dramatically if we could just compress these three steps into a single one. And that is exactly what pattern matching for instance of brings us. When we apply pattern matching for instance of, the code is reduced to this. And this is the, called a type pattern, guitar less pole. And it does three things at the same time. It does the test, it does the conditional extraction, and it does the binding to the variable less pole. And we can uh, use it directly with just one si single if statement. So we've seen a type pattern here. It consists of a predicate that specifies a type, guitar, and it specifies a binding variable, in this case, less pole. And it looks actually quite like a variable decoration. So that's a familiar concept to us all. Pattern matching, for instance, of is the first feature in Java that uses pattern matching. It allows the conditional extraction of components to be expressed more concisely and safely. But it's not a new concept in computer science. It has been supported by many programming languages already, like Haskell, C Sharp, 
Erlang and maybe more familiar to us folks, um, Scala, which also runs on the JVM. So let's dive into some practicalities. Let's uh, apply pattern matching for instance of. Um, I'm in the guitar class right now. It still has a name. It also has a few other fields uh, that we will use later on in the talk. But right now, I'm targeting this equals method, which has a familiar implementation, but it, it's again verbose, and it uses casting. And I don't really like it. Uh, but what we could do is just get rid of all this ceremony and just return value directly. Um, I want to know whether uh, the object O is an instance of guitar, and I'll call it other. And if it is, if this pattern, pattern match succeeds, then it will evaluate the right-hand side of the Boolean expression. And, and all these fields will be accessible because other is a guitar already in this context. But we've reduced the Eagles method to a single line implementation, just a single expression. That's, I really like that. that that's, that's great. Um, so what you need to get used to when you use pattern matching, for instance, of is that you are declaring in the middle, like here. We are very used to uh, using local variables at the left margin or at class level, uh, for instance, variables, for example, or as part of a for loop, a classic for loop. But patterns define variables in the middle of a statement or expression. So this might take some time to get used to. Also, the scoping of pattern binding variables is quite different. We are used to block scoping. You define a, a variable, and it will be available to you in the entire block until you meet a closing curly brace. Uh, but pattern binding variables use flow scoping, and it's defined by the set of places where the variable would definitely be assigned. So for example, um, in this example here, if product is an instance of guitar less Paul, so if this yields true, then the right hand side will be evaluated and Les Paul will be in scope here because Les Paul is actually a guitar. And you can call this guitar specific method. Is it in tune? Also, when the entire expression is true, then you can also use Les Paul here because it is a guitar. And actually, on top of that, it's a guitar that is tuned. However, in the else block, you can't use Les Paul because either the guitar is, uh, the Les Paul is not a guitar um, or it is a guitar that's not in tune. You can't use it right there. So that is flow scoping, a bit different. We see a lot of benefits. I don't think we will, see, we will see many casts anymore. I don't think you will be needing casts in your day to day work as a Java developer. And we've already seen that it's far more concise than the alternatives. So we will summarize the pattern kinds that we come across in this talk. The first kind that we saw right now is a type pattern, and it looks like this. And each time we encounter one, we will put the slide up with the Freddie Mercury statue because it's a kind of pattern. So uh, also, after every topic, we will inform you about the feature status. So can you use this already in Java in the latest version? And can you use it in production? Has the feature been finalized? And for type patterns, uh, for instance, of, we can say it has been finalized because in Java 16, the final implementation was uh, delivered. So no breaking changes to this feature whatsoever. You can use it safely in production. So that's great news. Moving on, because pattern matching can be applied to more concepts uh, besides instance of. And for this, we have to extend our music store a little bit. We've introduced some effect pedals, which are these stomp boxes that you can activate as a guitarist to distort your tone a little bit. And we've introduced an effect interface that just has the single apply method, and it has a, an implemented class delay and an implemented class reverb, and they have both separate properties that are specific to their own effect, a time in milliseconds for delay and a room size for reverb. When we want to um, couple this to the guitar, we obviously need an amplifier, which has a stock effect loop, for example, a delay and reverb that come, that come with the amplifier, but you can also attach an external effect loop. Uh, effect loop is essentially a grouping of effects, which just implemented here right now with a set of effects and to apply effect loop is essentially applying a series of effects. And to finalize the example a bit further, we just added a few more effect implementations. So besides delay and reverb, we've added a tuner, an overdrive, and a tremolo. OK, so let's put all these new classes into practice then, because for pattern matching, for instance, of, we are looking at this example here. And it's an impl implementation of the effect apply method. It takes an effect as a parameter, and for each instance, we want to provide a different string. So if it's a delay, we say delay active with this property. 
very active with these properties. And these are all specific properties for the instance here. This example is 25 lines of code, which is a train wreck. I mean, it can be a lot shorter. And we can actually make it shorter right now because we haven't introduced pattern matching for instance of yet. There are still costs here. So if we apply pattern matching for instance of, we can reduce the code and we don't need the costs anymore. So now we are down to 19 lines of code. But if you actually look at the actual business logic, they are these seven lines of code that actually contain the logic. And the remainder, so the 12 lines, they are all ceremony. And also, I don't like this else if repetition. There are so many options. A far better solution here will be a switch case statement. Uh, in its current form, the switch statement is quite limited because it can take only numbers and enum and string constants. Uh, but if we can extend the instance of keyword, why won't we be, couldn't we be able to extend the switch statement or expression? And it turns out we can with pattern matching for switch. So let's create a switch expression. Um, this became final functionality in Java 14. We'll try to use the default branch here for any unknown effects, like any uh, implementations of the effect interface that we're not familiar with, and add a few cases on the, on the go. And I think we've added them all right now. Well, effect loop has a different implementation because it's a grouping of effects, so it has to call apply recursively. Finally, we're done. And Right now, we have right reduced our code example from 20 lines to 19 to 11 lines of code with the, the remainder. Uh, the, the best part of the code is actually the business logic. So I really like that. That's much better. And uh, as you can see, the switch, the case statements have been extended to take type patterns here. And in the implementation, you can be sure that DE is actually a delay and TR is actually a tremolo. And you can call the specific methods of those implementation classes. Great stuff. Maybe you're wondering, why didn't you just implement the apply method that is defined in the effect interface here and just implement it differently in all classes? And that's a valid solution and a valid question, I guess. But we really wanted an example to um, explain better matching. Also, what would you do if you would have a functional operation that is not applicable to all effect implementers? So for example, we have just implemented apply, which can be used for any effect implementer. You could think of an operation set volume, for example, or contains for the effect loop object. Those are all sensible operations. And you, can extend, you could extend your effect API with these operations. But what if operations are just specific for a few implementers, like is the tuner currently active? Only the tuner knows whether it's active or not, and the other implementers don't have a clue. So they can't tell you anything about it. Uh, or what if you would want to compare certain properties? So the delay property time, compare it to the reverb room size. Only the delay knows its time. Only the reverb knows its room size. And only the effect loop knows whether both effect implementations are active in the first place. Is my current tone suitable to play Pride in the Name of Love by U2? The effect interface doesn't have a clue. So adding all these methods to the effect interface would probably not even be able to be implemented, but it would also pollute the API with lots of operations that don't belong in the API in the first place. And most of the times when you want to solve this problem, you would probably apply the visitor pattern from the design patterns gang of four book, um, because you can very specifically indicate that just a few, a few implementations of this interface will support uh, the operation. And that will work nicely. But for the visitor pattern to, uh, to work, you need a common supertype for everything. And you also need lots of uh, verbose verbosity, lots of ceremony again, to make sure that there are visitors for all supported classes. And pattern matching is a great alternative because you don't need the common supertype. You don't need all this ceremony. You can just use a switch case statement and provide a different implementation just for a few cases, for example. Although if you're thinking like this, this method doesn't need to be an instant method anymore. It's maybe best to make it a static method and put it in a utility class that just, uh, that just encapsulates a few functional operations that are specific to a few implementers. And you can just call these methods. They have effectively become pure functions right now. They don't need any state, and you can just call them whenever you want. So this leads me to a few benefits of pattern matching. We have already seen that there's no need for visitor pattern anymore or a common supertype. You can, 
in the first uh, iteration of our solutions, we had many assignments in the else if else if case. Now we can uh, we can replace it by a single expression. I think it's less error prone because adding a case is only a single line, so you won't forget a curly brace or something. Uh, it's definitely more concise, and Peter will return to this uh, to this topic in a bit. But it's also safer because the compiler can check for missing cases uh, in conjunction with sealed classes. And more on this uh, subject from Peter later. Okay, so maybe you're asking what what happens in this example when effect is null. Well, the classic implementation of a switch statement would throw a null pointer exception. If the parameter is null, it immediately throws a null pointer exception. Um, and if you want to uh, want to support null cases, then you have you would have to test for null. So above the switch uh, return statement, you would have to write if effect is null, uh, return an empty string or something. I really hate that solution because it repeats the return statement actually. Um, and it's also an edge case. So if you read this, you need you need some time to think about why is this an edge case? Why is it why is it relevant? Um, but starting from pattern matching for switch, um, Java will support null cases. So you can just add a case null, and you can actually comma separate them like regular case labels and combine it with the default uh, case to return a generic um, string about an unknown effect or a malfunction in effect or something. So that's also really concise. Short demo about guarded patterns, but because that's also a great addition uh, to the language. Um, so we open up the effect applier. This is the exact same code that I had on the slide. Um, and I'm looking at the tuner here. So if we encounter a tuner, we want to activate the tuner and make sure that this guitar gets tuned. But it's kind of a waste to Use this implementation for a guitar that is already in tune, right? So let's just add another case here uh, on top of it. And we'll just type case tuner. You and guitar is in tune. What will happen then? Well, then we can just probably uh, return an empty string, I guess, because nothing has to happen when the guitar is in tune. This is a guarded pattern, and it is an additional Boolean expression that is uh, executed when the pattern on the left-hand side matches. If it is actually a tuner, then uh, execute this Boolean expression. If it's true, execute the case statement. But if it's false, it falls through to the next case statement. This covers all other tuners, and then the tuner will be active because the guitar needs to be tuned. So these are guarded patterns, also very useful. So this is our second pattern kind, guarded pattern, and it looks like this. You can use pattern matching for switch in Java 17 as preview. Java 18 just came out last week. You can use it in second preview. It probably will be finalized in the, the next Java, but that has not been confirmed yet. So uh, yeah, keep, keep focus on that, I, I would say. And uh, you can try it out for yourself. Which brings me to deconstruction patterns, and Peter will tell us everything about that. Peter. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Hanno. So now is where it becomes very interesting, because we are going to look at upcoming features. So we have to give this disclaimer. Uh, we can't tell you if the following features are coming to Java. However, they are discussed by the architects of uh, Java, and there are some documents we will refer to. Uh, and therefore, syntax and implementation specifics may still change. So let's get into it. Uh, let's look at a deconstruction pattern. So we let's get back to our, let's get back to our example to our switch expression and introduce a deconstruction pattern. And if you are familiar with JavaScript or TypeScript, you may recognize this syntax. And in this case. The overdrive object uh, disappeared. We no longer have access to the entire object, but only gained access to the variable, in this case, gain. So we don't need to have ex we don't need to access the getter, we just can access the variable gain directly. So that looks very nice. It it, it focuses on the data you need in your case branch. So yeah. That makes us wonder what do we need to change to support such a deconstruction pattern. And 
Um, to support it, we have to introduce a pattern definition. And it uh, overdrive clause looks uh, like this right now. And if we want to introduce an overdrive pattern or pattern definition, it looks like this. It just it looks a bit like a reverse of a, a reverse constructor. We have an input parameter gain, and we bind the variable of the, 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 the value of the field gain to the parameter gain, and therefore we can support such a construct. So very interesting. So let's get back to our example. And if we add a pattern definition to every implementer of the effect interface, it looks like this. So sorry about the alignment. Hannah was a bit too lazy. Um, but you're gonna f you, you can fix this, uh, of course. And it, the benefits are quickly increasing because, for example, the reverb and tremolo case, we don't have to access each getter separately. We can just perform one pattern match and have all the data available we need. So we focus on the business logic. Um, it's a bit like going to the supermarket. You don't go in and out of the supermarket for each product. You just go into the supermarket and then buy two products and then leave. So, very convenient. So, we can also compose patterns, and we call the pattern composition. Hanno introduced the method. It's kind of a strange method, but if you want to implement it, this would be uh, this would be uh, a method. Is delay time equal to the reverb room size? So. For this case, we want to match if an effect loop consists of both uh, a delay and a reverb, and if that's the case, we want to do an equality test. So with pattern composition, this can be very concise. So um, it looks like this. So Hanna introduced the instance of pattern. So if we match an effect loop that is an instance of an effect loop, and it can be deconstructed as a delay and a reverb, in that case, we can do the equality test and um, otherwise return false. So, very concise. And if you look at the functional approach, it looks like this. And the imperial op imperative approach was kind of a train wreck. Uh, and we and didn't make the slides. So, very cool stuff. Uh, it's a pattern, uh, it's a deconstruction pattern, it's another kind of pattern. So maybe you remember the local variable type inferences, inference, and it became available in Java 10. And before we have, to, before Java 10, we have to define the object type uh, in every variable declaration. In this case, a guitar, and you can leave it out if it's, if you want. You can use var, uh, and that's very convenient if if that makes your code more readable and uh, instead of specifying an explicit type. So we can also use var pattern in our pattern composition. So let's introduce some. Uh, it looks like this. Um, we leave out the integer for the time in milliseconds, the string, and the, the integer for the room size, and just tell the compiler we don't care about the variable types. We only care about uh, if we can uh, deconstruct a delay as defined. Um, so we bind values to it. We can also introduce an any pattern. And if we think about any pattern, we still think about Homer. We're still find, trying to find the any key. But if we look at any patterns, uh, we can just uh, leave out the variable declaration um, in the pattern and just introduce um, an underscore, and then we tell the compiler we don't, we want to deconstruct it as two variables, but the difference is we don't want to bind a value to, uh, uh, to a, we don't buy, want to bind a value to a variable. So we can leave that out. It will be more readable if you, uh, if you can introduce it. Another Use case for patterns is optimization. We can do some optimization in case there is some heavy computation. For example, the effect loop, you see it at line eight here. Uh, it's a stream, we do some, some data transformation. And if you want to avoid doing that heavy computation, 
we can do it with pattern, um, pattern matching. Because if we look at it, we can, uh, if we look closely at the effect loop, we don't want to do some heavy computation if there is a tuner active, because that's not required in this business. So therefore, we add a new pattern match. We say, hey, if this effect loop can be deconstructed as a tuner and maybe other effects, but if there is a tuner in the effect loop, we just want to return a string and don't uh, do some heavy computation. So very cool stuff. Um, so the benefits we just described are better encapsulation. A case bench only uh, receives the data it actually actually references it to. Uh, we can focus on the business logic. There is a more elegant logic because it's very uh, powerful. Uh, we can do some optimization and avoid some heavy computation. So benefits quite uh, quite cool features. So it's another kind of pattern, a var pattern and an ending pattern. So these features are described in an exploratory document. You can uh, we have the, uh, the slides on our Twitter so we can share them with you. You can find the link there and you can read it in your uh, when you are interested in to foreign any patterns. There are some more other pa patterns in the document too. So very interesting stuff. So you may have heard of seal types and records, and you may use them today. And um, we, I'm going to demonstrate that pattern matching plays very nice with seal types. So if we look at our effect interface, and uh, we have here the default branch. But if we have all the cases that are possible, all the implement, uh, implementations of effect, why do we need a default branch? So um, if we make our effect implementation um, sealed like this, so we have here have the, the interface sealed. We introduce the sealed, um, sealed interface and we say to the compiler, hey, these are the subclasses uh, we, um, uh, that is permitted, then we don't need the, uh, the default branch anymore because all the implementations are in the switch expression. So if we leave out the default branch, we see um, IntelliJ is complaining. It doesn't cover all the possible input values. So let's add. The missing one, I think it's an octave. octave. I think in the octave is to make your sound of your guitar an octave higher and an octave lower. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so that's very cool. So octave, active, right. Oh. So I think, yes. So if you look at it, it's not complaining anymore. And because the compiler knows that all the cases are in the switch expression. So, very cool. Um, so you, you see it, we can leave out the default branch in the, uh, when the uh, interface is sealed. So, records, you may use them already. For records, there are still, there are some methods that will be generated for you. So, the f we imagine um, that uh, records will be the first, first installment of pattern matching because it can also, it may add an implementation for your deconstruction pattern for all records you describe. So um, that will be, the f we think it will be the very, uh, the, the first step into pattern matching. And uh, that's very cool, of course. So array patterns, another pattern. So you're going to see all those every pattern in our slides, and we make a, uh, we will list them for you at the end. So if you want to match for the, the objects in an array, you can use an array pattern. And in the first case, we, do, we want to match for an array without any objects, and we can add some objects to say, well, we want to, uh, we want to match for an effect loop with exactly one effect, uh, one effect or more with the spread operator, two objects or two objects or more. So array patterns will be 
um, will allow you to define such patterns. So it's another kind of pattern, an array pattern for arrays. Uh, for seal types, there are, we're in preview in Java 15. In 16, they are second preview and they are final now, so you can use them right away. Uh, completeness are yet in preview. Uh, we have seen Java 18 this week, so it's in second preview. So if you turn that on, you can use it. And uh, record patterns are still in preview, and um, you can read about it in the JEP 4 or 5. So let's get back to Hanno for some things about serialization. Yes, thank you, Peter. A better serialization, well, that's, that's like a dream come true, right? Um, before I dive into it, we have to give you a disclaimer plus plus. I call this here be dragons, because we can't be sure at all that the following features will appear in Java as depicted. They are ideas. We don't know if it will ever get, uh, find its way into Java. We certainly hope so, uh, because, and because we don't know uh, why or when. We can also not tell you when. <laughs> so um, we have talked about constructors and deconstruction patterns uh, before in the talk and the relation between them, because you can view them as opposites. A constructor takes a set of typed fields and transforms them into a populated object, whereas a deconstruction pattern does the opposite. It transforms a populated object into a set of typed fields. And this duality is very relevant when it comes to serialization. Quick introduction, but I think all you folks already know about this, but serialization is an important feature for Java because Java became popular because of remote method invocation and serialization was, was key to that. But many people really hate its current implementation. Uh, it undermines the accessibility model because it uses field scraping through reflection magic. So it doesn't even matter if a field is private, it just gets, uh, gets populated anyway. Uh, serialization logic is not readable code because it happens under the hood. So you can also not run any uh, quality checks on it, like Sonar, for example. Uh, and it bypasses constructors and data validation. So if you use your constructor to validate the data that is being plugged into your object, well, with serialization, you're out of luck because it's not being used. But I think when we use better matching for serialization, this situation can improve dramatically. So say, for example, that we use our effect loop class. Uh, if you remember our grouping of effects, uh, which is implemented in this case by a name and a set of effects, what if we want, would want to serialize this class? Well, um, we would add a pattern definition, of course. Uh, to be able to make uh, use of uh, pattern matching in other places. Uh, but we can also use this pattern definition in theory to serialize our object. So let's say that the serialized form of this effect loop is a string and an array of effects because it translates well to, to a clear text or JSON or whatever you want, the Java serialization format. Um, well, um, if you would want to serialize it, you could just take the name field and the effect field, uh, convert it to an array and plug it into these pattern variables. And these pattern variables will become available and the result will be written to disk and you have serialized your object. To deserialize it, you could, for example, overload your constructor right here and make it take uh, uh, the serialized form, so a name and again, an array of effects then use the, uh, the other constructor to set the name and to initialize the effect set and then add every effect in the array to the effect set and you have populated your object and you have effectively deserialized your object. Well, to make the intent of these two, of the constructor and the method or uh, the pattern definition more clear, you could maybe annotate them with deserializer or serializer. And in this case, the intent is very clear. And to summarize, we have really improved on the drawbacks because we are using the accessibility model because the name is just um, reachable from within our own class. Uh, it's actually readable code, the serialization logic, and we actually use constructors. So if we want to do any validation, we can do it right here. So we're no longer bypassing constructor calls. Of course, some challenges still remain. How would you? for example, support multiple versions of one class. Well, one of the ideas is to uh, extend the annotation I showed you uh, with a property version. And you could maybe uh, provide multiple 
pattern definitions or multiple constructors that um, that serialize and deserialize for a specific version. Well, feature status, I already told you in the future, but actually this entire feature is very still very much in, in the future. But the document that we linked here is very interesting to read, uh, read up on, on and to, um, to see uh, where this is heading. And maybe the status of this feature will change a few times in the, in the coming year. So uh, we'll try to keep an eye on it. But if you're interested, you can too. There are a lot of more ideas to expand better matching. Also, we can't be sure when they appear, when or whether they will appear in Java. But these are these are the ideas uh, as they currently stand. Pattern bind statements. So until now, we saw that you could uh, use pattern matching in uh, instances of next to the instance of keyword and in a switch case. But there are plans to introduce a single statement that just unwraps this object uh, and and puts the uh, puts the separate field in these pattern matching variables. And then after this line, you could do something with, in this case, name and room size. Um, this double underscore syntax is the way that the Java language designers uh, um, denote that it's a temporary keyword. So they are thinking about naming this keyword let, but by the double underscore syntax, they say, uh, don't count on this. It could change very much. So that's the double underscore syntax. Uh, more, uh, more on this uh, subject uh, when you follow this link. Um, and actually, you can extend the pattern bind statement by providing an else clause. If the pattern doesn't match, you can, for example, throw an exception that says not a reverb or not a reverb with the right fields in it. Here's a list of some other ideas, very new ideas, and they are quite likely to change. But this is how things currently stand. And patterns that can combine two patterns and will only match when both patterns match. Patterns in catch clauses. Catch clauses can right now uh, throw multiple exceptions. Uh, sorry, catch multiple exceptions, of course. Um, this can be extended, for example, with pattern matching. So you can catch more, th more stuff. Um, collection patterns, which probably will work like array patterns, but then for sets and lists and maps and, and also um, other collections. Um, more information on this and all these ideas we found in the uh, Project Amber mailing list. So if you're really interested, follow that mailing list and we'll, you will know the same things as we know right now. To summarize, we have seen three separate contexts in which you can apply pattern matching. And two of them are available to you right now, the instance of predicate and the switch statement or expression. And in the future, probably also pattern bind statements. The pattern kinds we already summarized on separate slides, right? So. Let's wrap the entire subject up here. We think pattern matching is a rich feature arc that will play out over several versions of Java. The first installment allows us to use type patterns in instance of, which reduces the ceremony of such code. And the second installment brought us pattern matching in switch. Future installment will probably bring deconstruction patterns on records and, and I think a lot more also. With the aim of making deconstructor, destructuring objects as easy as constructing them and more similar to that. Together with the related features of records and sealed types, pattern matching holds the potential to simplify and streamline much of the Java code we write today. And that is why we think that we have to conclude that pattern matching is a major feature that's very interesting and it will shape the future of our programming language. And we really want to keep track of it and make use of it wherever we can. So with that, we come to the final slide. We want to thank you for your attention. As we mentioned, the code is on GitHub and the slides will be uh, at our Twitter accounts later today. Um, and if there are any questions, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you.